I'm Steffi Kirsten. I was born and raised in Germany, spent about 18 years in Mexico, and moved to Spain about two and a half years ago. You know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Farrier Podcast. Every horse, whatever it was doing, had a season. Once their competition season finished, they took the shoes off, they chucked it out in the field with some other horses, and it had a two, maybe three months period where it went and remembered what being a horse was all about. Even in a cheaper area, your prices should be set by your skill level, by your experience. And some people might not feel that they're worth, you know, as much as others. But if you're only charging $160 to shoe a horse, then the only way you're making money is on your trims. The WCB was a way to, to make sure that you kept the trade alive. I think I'm a custodian of the trade, so it's like we have to keep it going. It was hard, but, you know, you adapt and overcome, and that probably gets to me where I am now. It's problem solving, horseshoeing's problem solving, and back in the day it was problem solving how to be as strong as the older apprentices. So it's all about adapting and overcoming, which was good. I know we learn every day, but you do have to put yourself outside the box and I'm just continue to learn, which is why I was just trying to do my fellowship because I still have apprentices. And if I stay at my AW, I'm stagnant. Welcome everyone. No shopkeeping for today. I have run into today's guest several times over the years, and unfortunately our exchanges have always been brief. I was looking forward to getting to know Steffi better at Vern Powell's Puerto Vallarta clinic in Mexico, but I missed one trip and she missed the other. We finally connected at last year's Stonely for long enough to be able to sit down and do this interview. As you'll hear, Steffi started her shoeing career with very little knowledge and very few tools. But through her ability to network, she found herself a world full of mentors. And once she set her sights on the certification process through the AFA, it is incredible to hear how much she sacrificed and how much grit and determination carried her through that process so that she was eventually able to achieve her CF. She's an inspiration and a force to be reckoned with. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Lots of life changes. Oh yeah, of course. How does somebody from Germany end up in Mexico? Ooh, everybody asks me that question. Basically, uh, one of my best friends made me to go on vacation, backpacking through the Yucatan. After I had just uh, finished my master's in biology and I started to do a PhD program in zoology, I was very unhappy with that <laughs> because cutting up butterfly wings gives you pretty much bad karma for the rest of your life. <laughs> so I went to Mexico and I really liked it there, decided that I would just go back to Germany, save some money, cancel my PhD program and then uh, travel back to Mexico with 600 euros and 34 kilos of luggage spend a year there and see what to do with the rest of my life. Okay. What was it about Mexico that drew you there? German people are usually quite distant and cold. Not everyone, but... It's a stereotype, yeah. It's quite the stereotype. Mexican people are really warm and welcoming and, of course, the weather. <laughs> I mean, the Yucatan is in the tropics or subtropics. It's a beautiful area. You have the Caribbean beaches. You have the most beautiful freshwater caves in the world, mm -hmm. which I wanted to scuba dive. And yeah, then I ended up uh, living there, got a job as an adventure guide. Oh, okay. Yeah, snorkeling in the caves, kayaking out to the reefs, rappelling into the caves. It was absolutely amazing. And then I ended up running a ranch with rescued horses, where we did very exclusive tours through the jungle and along the beach. And I grew up with horses, and yeah, then I got stuck there. <laughs> got stuck there. So when you were pursuing your PhD in zoology, you said, what was your end goal there? Do you know what you wanted to do with that? I wanted to work with animals. There was never a question about what I would be in my later life. I either wanted to be a vet or a biologist. I opted for biology, and then I realized that there's basically 
no money in it. Right. I specialized in animal behavior and parasitology. I wanted to work with animals and I didn't want to end up in a lab. And at the end, everything that you could do there was uh, sitting in a lab doing genetics or, yeah, well, cutting up butterfly wings. <laughs> <laughs> so you worked for this ranch. Well, what's the story of how you then started shoeing horses? Basically, in Mexico, if you have a horseback riding ranch, usually you have the grooms there and they shoe the horses. I mean, it's normal in Canada and in the US. If you have a bigger outfit, we weren't a big outfit. We only had between 12 and 14 horses. Hmm. But my boss, a Swedish woman, she brought in a certified farrier from Mexico City to basically train the guys over a weekend. Crazy, huh? <laughs> uh, to shoe the horses. <laughs> and she was like, Steffi, would you like to join them? And I was like, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And so we had this guy coming to the ranch and the first thing I said to him, so you want me to shoe horses within a weekend? And in Germany, it's a two-year training. In the UK, it's a four-and-a-half-year training or whatever. And I should learn it through Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday. And he just looked at me and was like, yeah, well, nobody has any ed education here. So if you do the two-day course or the two-day clinic with us, then um, you're going to know more than most people in the area that shoe horses. I was like, yeah, that's crazy. So I joined. I got kicked across the yard <laughs> by one of our horses. Yeah. And I didn't feel confident at all. So what I was, was doing was I was just helping the guys that were shoeing the horses for about a year. Then he came back. This is the guy who trained you? Yeah. Came back? Yeah, he came back after a year to give us some more teaching. And I kept on helping the guys, you know, just clinching and finishing. And then one of the two guys left. So. I ended up with uh, starting to shoe six of the 12 horses we had by that time. And then a year later, the second guy left. And we were actually a pure girl's ranch, very unique in the, in the south of Mexico. Okay. And I ended up with uh, shoeing all the horses we had. You couldn't really call it shoeing. <laughs> you know, I did my best. <laughs> Didn't really have a proper distributor in the area. I had to ship stuff in from Mexico City. Then I got into the farrier forums on the internet and I was asking for advice like, please help, I have no clue what I'm doing. Am I messing these horses up? And I got tremendous help from a lot of people. Then Facebook started and the farrier groups and I received tons of support there. Went to a couple of clinics. I think my first clinic was with uh, Chris Gregory in Mexico City. Okay, yeah. Mustard put that on. We had around uh, 120 attendees. Four of them were girls. Yeah. They were all vets. Oh, really? So everybody yeah. walked up to me and was, they were like, so Steffi, you're a vet, right? And I was like, no, when I grow up, I would like to be shooting horses. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just continued. I continued working at the ranch, guiding the tours, um, taking care of the horses. And when they needed shoes, every month, I would get into the fire and would shoe them. So you actually did have a forge? Yeah, we actually okay. we had an animal. We had a forge. At one point, we got a hoof stand. Oh. Yeah, that was a game changer. At, yeah. Um, we had a really, really bad clincher, so I hammer clinched everything, and I'm quite grateful for having that really basic setup because I had to kind of MacGyver stuff together. Right, yeah. You learn a lot from having a little. Yeah, exactly. So I would be like, so I need to fill this foot with something, but we can't get uh, Ekipak here. How do I do that? Somebody suggested, oh, make yourself some cornstarch and plumber's silicone and really yeah no it's absolutely insane but it works so really? you just mix it together and you have some kind of like dental impression -y material really yeah okay so i would just take pictures take videos and would send them to a couple of guys kevin alcock for example mm -hmm. i consider him actually my mentor right and he helped me a lot david hall gave me a lot of advice rick shepherd from the u.s no, there were some uh, some great people that uh, supported me. And without them, I would have thrown my tools into the trash <laughs> plenty of times and just given up. And I just continued to do that for various years. Okay, so how long ago would this have been? Like you said, then Facebook came along, so it was a, a while ago. I think I did the first clinic around 13 years ago. Okay, yeah. 12 years ago. Yeah, 13 years ago. 
yeah, and then around six, seven years ago, I started to kind of got to the point where I burned out because the ranch work was just too much. And then I started to basically uh, go independent and crazy. Like chewing your own horses? Yeah. So I stopped doing the ranch work, kind of had to work as a translator to just support myself. Mm -hmm. And then started to show a couple of ranch horses. And then I got hit up by a local guy that had riding school. Okay. And he had a couple of horses that had issues with their feet and the farriers in the area couldn't sort them out. He was like, Steffi, could you please help me? And by that time, I was already attending the Hoofcare Summit every year. Right. Kevin Alcock and I became super good friends. And I went up to Canada various times per year to, to work with him and learn tons of stuff. Then I got a forge donated and an anvil. Hmm. Yep. Donated by whom? Kevin Alcock, Miriam Brown from Quebec. And I think in total it was 12 guys wow. and girls. Yeah. They actually bought a secondhand forge, a pro forge. Okay. Which I put on a plane. <laughs> and I also got an anvil donated just a couple of months beforehand. You should bring that through security. Yeah. At no the kidding. airport, yeah. yeah. You bring that to the x-rays and they all go like, <laughs> oh, what's that? What are you smuggling? <laughs> I brought all that equipment down. I got a lot of uh, secondhand tools donated because basically when I left the ranch, it was the ranch equipment. Right. I had nothing. I remember I was showing the first horses and doing my nipper runs with pull-offs because I didn't have nippers. Wow. And I didn't have the money to basically uh, sort myself out with uh, good equipment at the beginning. So little by little, with great support from a, a lot of people, I got my stuff set up and I started showing horses. I got more people contacting me, and I ended up with full books pretty much after a year. Yeah. Yeah. Showing uh, mainly show jumpers, school horses, and some ranch ponies. Okay. Very cool. So were there many farriers in the area, or was it just people kind of like the ranch, where they just sort of knew enough to get a shoe on, and that was it? There were a couple of guys around, and they did great work. Okay. But at the end, I had the advantage that I could go, for example, to, to the U.S. or to Canada. Right, and learn more. And learn more, exactly. Because I didn't have the language barrier. Right. And a lot of the people that have horses there that show jump, they're actually foreigners. So they kind of appreciated the fact that uh, they could talk to me in English. They right. could actually understand what was going on. <laughs> and so at the end, I was basically showing all the show jumpers in our area, south of Cancun, and learned a lot made me a very humble person because <laughs> the climate is incredibly humid, especially in rainy season, which is about six months out of the year. There's a constant shortage of bedding. Oh, really? Yeah. That sounds great for feet. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can basically, on half of the feet, you just flick the foot with your fingernail and you can peel off layers of uh, hoof wall. <laughs> so everything is basically on four weeks. Four weeks, maximum four and a half, five. Otherwise, the shoes don't, don't hold. And then everything gets showered because they sweat. It's tropical. So it's absolutely horrendous. Quite nice. So what were some of the things that you did that you think helped that issue? Telling people to not shower their horses every day, twice. Insisting on uh, better bedding. Okay. Which uh, fell on a lot of deaf ears <laughs> most of the time. But I mean, it was a huge issue because you can't really buy commercial bedding. Right. You have to go to the carpentries. And get their sawdust or whatever. Exactly. They basically do not have turnout. They're always in a stall. There's a lot of stall walking, a lot of weaving. So that doesn't help. Flies and mosquitoes are horrendous. So the fly stomping just trashes everything. Right. You can basically shake the shoes off the feet after four weeks. Yeah, so you're just constantly struggling with the feet you're dealing with. Yeah, constantly struggling. I got a tip to use clear coat. Like paint? paint. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Just and it a, works? a spray can. Basically, after you shoe the horses, they have fairly dry feet because they're not standing in piss and water. And I mean, when it rained, a lot of stores flooded. Okay. Yeah. We had stuff coming down. You have no idea. Like the entire coast was flooded. So once you burn the shoe on and you nail it on and you finish, you actually put some clear coat paint on it. Hmm. And then that protects it. Exactly. Would you have them put it on in between your shoeings? Yeah, I asked for it. <laughs> if they did, I'm not 100% sure. Or, for example, Gorilla Glue. Mm -hmm. Just uh, glove up your hand, put some Gorilla Glue on it, just smear the feet with it. And that would protect them. 
And then you have a protective layer, yeah. Hmm. A lot of thrushy feet and white line disease. Yeah. I remember I had a white line case on a horse that's actually on the way to Germany now because his owners moved. Lucky. <laughs> I went to the barn to shoe him and I knew I had to resect some off and I kind of suspected it's going to be bad. So I actually packed my cooler with uh, with Eki locks and Eki puck and what have you not seen. I took everything with me and I started resecting and I remember calling Kevin, sending him pictures and videos and I was like, you know what? I'm shitting my pants here. What do I do? And he was like, yeah, after looking at these pictures, I would be shitting my pants too. I'm like, that's not what I want to hear. He's like, just put on the full package. I basically resected the foot, put Eki Puck at the bottom after I put on the shoe. And then I rebuilt basically. The whole foot. <laughs> yeah. I left a treatment window so they could actually apply medication. The horse was always sound. After about nine, ten months, it looked like a normal foot again. And they could uh, actually use the horse. Cool. But I remember that gave me an absolute anxiety attack because <laughs> the next day I was just sitting in front of the phone on the beach, one of my very, very few days off. <laughs> and I'm like, he's going to found her. He's going to found her. I will get a call and they will tell me that horse is done. And he didn't. Nope. Clearly. I had a bunch of uh, vet referral cases. I was going to ask, like, if you had much assistance from the vets, how that worked out. I think at the beginning, a lot of people were skeptical. You never see a woman in Mexico shoeing horses, at least not at my time. And now there are a couple of girls that are starting, which is really nice to see. But I remember the grooms would come and would take pictures of me and would be like, so you are the farrier? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's what I would like to be when I grow up, <laughs> was my standard answer. The vets started to see my work and they really liked it. The Yucatan Peninsula covers about an area as big as England and Wales together. Oh, okay. There's one hospital, one equine hospital, which is about four hours away from uh, where I lived. So if you have a colleague... It's done. Yeah. yeah. You rush to the hospital and you, you hope that the horse survives. So I started to work with that vet and he started to call me and he would send me x-rays and uh, pictures and he would be like, this is in your area, in this, in this village, blah, blah, blah. What would you like to do, Steffi? What are we going to do? <laughs> so most of the time I would hit up Kevin or mm -hmm. David or some other people would get advice. And I would tell the vet, let me check with my mentors because I didn't feel confident, at least not at the beginning. And at the end, Kevin would always say, yeah, you know already what to do. Why are you asking me? Oh, I just need reassurance. <laughs> yeah, so then I would give the vet two, three options what we could do and he would be like, yeah, I like this one. Can you please do that? Yeah. A couple of laminitis cases, a couple of full extensions. And then would you have to travel for some of those? Or he would only refer you ones that are close? I think the furthest I would travel was about 45 minutes an hour. I'm really lazy. I don't like driving. <laughs> so that wasn't too bad. No, that wasn't too bad. And I would tell him, you know what? I don't think it's fair if I have to travel further because I cannot do a proper follow-up. Mm -hmm. Because I'm so fully booked, I right. will not have the time. Right. Was it something, because I've heard from a lot of people that Mexico and then lots of South America, farriers don't get paid very much. No. Did you have to play a numbers game in order to earn a living or how did that work? At the beginning, of course, you place yourself like in the normal price range. Yeah. Quite low. I'm a really bad business person <laughs> in general and I'm really bad with numbers. Fairly quickly, when I started to fill up my books, I started to raise my prices. So I ended up being at the higher end. Okay. I was able to cover my costs pretty good and put some money away. Oh, good. So, yeah, that was nice. That was really nice. And then I spent it all going to the summer to, to convention, <laughs> buying tools. <laughs> Funny how that works. I've heard a few stories from you and from people who've spoken with you about the intricacies of dealing with the underworld of Mexico. Is that something you feel comfortable talking about? or I think uh, people don't... It's not a surprise? No, because it's unfortunately it's something that's happening. And when you move there, you think, ah, it's not that bad. And honestly, when I moved there, when was it 20 years ago, 21 years ago? The town I was living in, Playa de Carmen, was a, it was already very touristy, but it still had this Caribbean fisherman's village charm. You would go out at night. You would always meet people that you know. And then it became the fastest growing area in the world. Oh, really? Yeah. 
because of tourism or because of tourism okay. because a lot of uh, Canadians and uh, Americans retired to that area real estate went through the roof right and then locals can't afford it locals can't afford it and you know that the cartels are always there the drug cartels it's something that that is unfortunately fairly normal in the in the area but the tourism wasn't affected normal people weren't affected and then it all went tits up about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, because mm -hmm. there were a lot of shifts. Uh, there were a lot of changes in the cartels, I would say. A lot of northern Qatar people moved down. At the end, it got quite hairy. We had a lot of crime starting. And the problem was also you have so many very, very rich people and you have so many very poor people. Right. And there is not really a proper middle class. So you either have money or you don't have money. Mm. And there's a lot of corruption. So at the end, if you have to drive eight kilometers into the jungle where you don't have phone reception and you are at the point where you have to think like, dear God, I hope I don't run into some criminal activity here. Mm. I mean, I will be done. Me as a woman in general, it's probably not a good idea to drive into the jungle, but, <laughs> but then it became quite hairy. Really? And even in the town, would you feel safe going out at night or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to use your common sense. Okay. Don't do hookers, don't do drugs, don't do guns. <laughs> it's as simple as is. Okay. So, I mean, if you go there on vacation and you're not stupid, you yeah, shouldn't have an okay. issue. But I mean, I was, I was driving out in the jungle. I was driving into the small villages. I've gotten a lot of phone calls. And I mean, I would tell people please don't give my phone number to other people that are asking for a ferrier. I always try to just stay in the, in the riding barns. Right. I had very, very few private clients that I would go to that I knew that they would be okay, but I would get these phone calls. Hello, we are... First of all, they were shocked when a woman would answer the phone. <laughs> right. Yeah, we are looking for a ferrier. We are having four racehorses here. And I'm like, oh, I have no idea what to do with racehorses. I'm really sorry. Can I give you another phone number? Was it kind of like a trap to no. go to a place like that? No, or? absolutely not. They were, for sure, these people had horses and they needed a farrier. And I'm pretty sure that they would have been okay. Oh, okay. But there is a high possibility if somebody has racehorses. And over there, it's the matching races. So it's two quarter horses usually running um, a short distance. You're right. There's a lot of sketchy stuff going on at the races. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just not comfortable mm. going there. I did it once to look at a white line case, and it was quite an eye-opener. Oh, really? A lot of people there. Yeah, it was very interesting, but I did not want to do that type of work. I didn't feel comfortable with the surroundings. I didn't feel comfortable. The people were always super nice. I mean, the ones that I met, they were really, really nice people, and they were like, yeah, we know we are four hours away, we can send a van with a driver so he can rest doing the drive. Uh, we pay whatever. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't do racehorses. I'm really sorry. If you prick a racehorse, you might be done. Right. Because it's your fault, you know? You right. hear a lot of stories where you think, oh my God, this is out of the movies. But it's actually your friends telling you that. Like, they bring you a horse that is colicking. And they're like, if you don't fix him, that's it. You're going to be done. <laughs> if the horse <laughs> dies, you die. Nah, mm -mm, not for me. High stakes shoeing. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. No pressure here. Huh? No, not at all. So you built your business. How long on your own did you work in Mexico then? Probably three or four years, maybe. Okay. I did a time where I did a couple of days part time at the ranch again. Okay. And I was shoeing them. And then I just didn't have the time. Then I moved to Spain after I did my certification, which was my big goal. And that's what my next question was going to be. So what made you decide to pursue your CF with the AFA? I always want to learn more. I do not want to get stuck in one place. Well, clearly you moved around a lot. You know how it is. You know, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect. At the beginning, you think you know it all. And then once you get more experience, you actually realize how little you know yep. and how much more you have to learn. So I always wanted to progress further. For me, the AFA was the perfect option. They were right around the corner. I was going to Mexico or to the U.S. anyway. Met great people. Vern Powell, for example. <laughs> Amazing guy. And I just wanted to have something that proves that I'm not a total idiot chewing horses. <laughs> That's how I always explain it. Yeah. 
It is what it is. And what was that journey like for you? Where did you take your exams? I took my exam. I went up to work with Vern Powell because the first time uh, the summit offered the written test, I wasn't sure if I should take it. And the Canadian, the Ontario Farriers and I, we would always drive down to the summit. I would fly up from Mexico to Toronto. <laughs> and then a day or two days later, we would drive down to Cincinnati, which is a nine hour journey. Always fun crossing the border, by the way. Yeah, he, the you were Germ telling us. That. German chick with a Mexican address living in Mexico, flying up to Canada and then just driving down to, to the US. With a van full of guys. With a van full of guys. They always took me out into a separate interviewing room to see if I was being smuggled or <laughs> trafficked. What they didn't realize was that I was trafficking the guys down. Yeah, and I, I could just picture the group of guys you would have been going down with who are like the nicest, just <laughs> the least likely to be trafficking a human exactly. being. Exactly. Like Kevin Dort and Wes Cowie, they were always yeah. uh, on the road with us. <laughs> Jessica, Kevin's apprentice. Mm -hmm. It was nice. It was real fun. And I mean, the road trip was always part of, of the summit fun. Right. So anyway... I was going to do my CF, but not at that time, at the summit. And everybody was like, you should try it, you should try it. And I was like, I haven't really studied. Oh, yeah, you're studying all the time. So <laughs> you know how it is. You get there on Monday evening and you end up at the bar. And you stay there until the bar closes. So the next day in the morning is the CF exam. <laughs> <laughs> Great timing. That's how I actually met Vern Powell and uh, Mark Torkinsall. Yep. Yep. They were running the show. And I pretty much ran through the exam. Yeah, they said 14 minutes. <laughs> Walked out and Mark was like, are you sure you're, you're done? You don't want to go through those questions? And I was like, no, that's when I messed it up. So then apparently I did pass them. <laughs> Barely, but I did. And then I knew I had to continue mm -hmm. with the practical and the shoe mods. So Vern and I, we said I would come up to Chicago, work with him and Heather for a couple of days. I prepared my shoe board, most of them. Uh, flew up, passed my shoe board, didn't pass my practical. Of course, I just wasn't ready. Right. I could also blame it on the horse, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> the fire spitting fury coming off the trailer. Uh, oh, wonderful. <laughs> but I mean, it is what it is. I learned a lot. So when I didn't pass it, Jennifer Horn was my examiner. And she was like, I'm really sorry, Steffi. I was trying to find points, but it wasn't there. And I think I missed it by two points or something like uh -oh. that. Yeah, it was very frustrating. She was like, do you want me to explain what you did wrong? And I'm just sitting there with tears in my eyes, about to sob. And I'm like, no, <laughs> go away. Give me five minutes. <laughs> then I went back to Burns' place. And he straight away got on, uh, on the phone with uh, Kelly Liptrot in Utah. Right. And he was like, Steffi, six weeks, got to be ready. You're going to Salt Lake City. <laughs> so then I went up to, to Kelly's and we did a couple of CF uh, runs there and went to Antelope Island, which was great. I saw the, the buffaloes. And then we went to the certification there and I thought I had messed it all up again. <laughs> really? You weren't feeling good in your oh, run? Oh, absolutely not. I was really confident at the beginning going in. And then I absolutely struggled. I had a horse which was uh, in between sizes. Okay. And I couldn't really decide what to do. And at the end, I just uh, slapped the shoe on. Like I just just barely finished on time, mm. walked out, started calling my friends. I'm like, yeah, that's it. I didn't do it. So then David Sierra, the examiner, walks out. And I'm like, yeah, I know I messed it up. He's like, no, you passed. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> it's like, welcome to the professionals. <laughs> I've heard lots of good stories about him. Yeah, he's fun. Yeah. He's a really, really good teacher. No, I had a great time there. I learned a lot. And I met, and that's the, the fun thing about the, the AFA also. You get so much support. You meet so many nice people. And if you need anything, you just need to ask. Mm -hmm. You will always find support. Yeah, you do. Then what led you to move back to Europe? Well, the plan was always, so I actually had a son. He's going to be 12 now. Yeah, in between all this, <laughs> I actually got knocked up. <laughs> had a child. The vet at the ranch would always say, this child has seen more colleagues and treated more colleagues than <laughs> uh, some of the vets here in the area because he would always be at the horses with me. Right. And I remember I would put him uh, in his baby crate in a wheelbarrow and would wheel wheelbarrow him around. <laughs> uh, when he was a little bit older, he, uh, I would just bring his homework from preschool to the ranch when we had an emergency. 
he would clean out my shoeing truck. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he got candy little for assistant. it. Little assistant. I would take him to the yards, to the barns, and uh, he would hang out with the kids there. Okay. Kind of a fun way to grow up. Yeah. I and his father and I, we separated and uh, we actually decided that we would be moving back to Europe separately, but, you know, together for the child. Right. And apparently that was a very urgent thing at one point, just about when Julian turned six and uh, was going to get into school. So we set up for Spain and I did tell them, I need a year. I need to finish my CF because honestly, if I move to Spain and I have to start building up a business again, it would have been difficult. Without some credential. Exactly, because I had the full book. I was able to shoe horses every day. Mm -hmm. So I would get all my practical stuff in. And then taking a break, I knew that I would have to start from zero. Right. So then I said, okay, you can move over there. I'll follow you after a year. I said, okay. And they were like, yep. Yeah. All right. So I went over to, to Spain a couple of times to be with my son. I always remember I had to make up for, for that shoeing for the 10 days that I would be in Spain. Yeah. So I would shoe until like 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock at night. And I would always, always fall into those two times of the year where some of the horses would go to the Mexico City area <laughs> where they actually had to jump on grass. So uh, I had to drill and tap everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Favorite part of shoeing, drilling Mine and tapping. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then COVID hit. So at the end, it was about two and a half years that we were separated. Wow. Me and my son. But then I moved over to Spain after I did my CF. Now I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got, uh, I got pretty much to the burnout point. Yeah. Sounds like you would. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I was working every day a month and maybe had one day off. And usually I would get an emergency call in. On that day. Yeah. Yeah. Murphy's Law. Yeah. Striking again. So yeah, then I moved to uh, the south of Spain, to Andalusia, and I had a year off, trying to figure out, again, trying to figure out what to do with my life. Mm. And about a year and a half ago, I said to a friend of mine who worked as a horsemanship trainer, because she was always saying, Steffi, clients of mine, they need a farrier. I mean, they're, they're just barefoot horses, but they really, really are looking for someone. I was like, all right, I'm ready now. Bring it on. So I started to do barefoot horses and I was absolutely shocked about the Spanish feet. Oh, really? Yeah, because you basically move from wet tropical climate into desert country. Right. Oh, dear God, how do people do this all their life? <laughs> like just doing a proper nipper run. Right, yeah. At the end of summer, Pretty August, tough. September, four months, no rain. Feet are rock hard. Right. Something completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there I am now. Being a barefoot trimmer, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like it. I mean, I have nothing, no money tied up in dead stock of shoes or whatever. Right. And uh, I can just throw everything in, into the boot, sorry, trunk of my car and uh, drive around. Trim horses. I have really, really nice clients. A nice full book for what I want to do. Yep. So that I actually have uh, some time for myself and for my child. Yeah. I took on a uh, part-time job at the Andalusian Rescue Center for Horses. So we work together with the police. Oh, really? Take in horses, rehabilitate them if we can. Mm -hmm. And then we try to adopt them out. Oh, okay. So I, I actually see a lot of really, really messed up cases. In the feet. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And in those situations, are you getting back into shoeing again? Or do you have the equipment even yeah. to do it? No, I actually hauled everything over oh, you in did? a container. Yeah, oh, okay. I have my forge. My forge is set up in, uh, at the house, in the garden, basically on a small terrace. I have everything there. Okay. But I'm just not ready to shoe. Yeah. I miss forging a lot. I miss the smell of uh, burning shoes on feet. And I started to try to knock out a couple of handmade shoes, and they're absolutely horrible. <laughs> if you have an hit an iron for about two and a half, three years nearly. I mean, the amount of crap that you produce. Yeah, it's not like riding a bike. You do lose some of it. Yeah, a lot, Yeah, actually. If we need shoes at the rescue center, we have a great guy, Jaime Kanya, who is a certified uh, Euro farrier. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic farrier. Hmm. And uh, he comes out, and then we uh, do the horse together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. It's really nice. A good way to get your feet wet. 
Yeah, and a couple of times we have met up and uh, did a couple of forging exercises. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Got into the Andalusian Farriers Association. Hmm. So uh, let's see what happens there. Yeah, I can already picture it. You're going <laughs> to go full bore again. <laughs> maybe not with shoeing, but maybe I should start training my right arm again. This is the Stratum Tectorium. Short answer questions brought to you by Outwest Design and Fabrication. Your choice for farrier rakes. The first one is, what is your favorite book? Papillon by Henri Chaillet. What's that about? Butterflies? No, well, no. It's, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. Won an Oscar. Oh, no. Yeah. It's about a guy that gets sent to French Guyana in uh, South America. And there he has to catch butterflies. Okay. And he gets sent to a prison island. And it's a true lifetime story of Henri Chayer. Okay. Yeah. You should at least watch the movie. Watch the original movie because they did a second version just a couple of years ago, which is shit. <laughs> but... <laughs> The original movie is really good. And if you ever read the book, it's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's a big one, though. A, a big book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite brand of nails? Liberty. What shoe sizes would you usually have to stock the most of? Between double odd and one. Okay. Favorite make of rasp? Basoli. What is your dream farrier rig? A Toyota Hilux. My Megatron that I left in Mexico. It wouldn't have passed the technical inspection in Spain. Oh, okay. Favorite rounding hammer? Andy Darden. Hmm. I love mine. Favorite pastime after work? I will give you my second one so Heather doesn't have to edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix. I'm totally boring. <laughs> What's next on your bucket list? Going to Iceland, riding Iceland horses up to the volcanoes and glaciers. Which is funny because last night somebody at the bar said, so you're from Iceland, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I remember that one, yeah. <laughs> Favorite type of bar stock to work with? Anything that is 516. Okay. Because uh, apparently in Europe, if you train for competitions, they bring you a lot of 10 mil stock. Yeah. And I mean, I'm just not used to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I quite enjoy the 10 mil. I don't. <laughs> Ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day. Ooh, let me remember four. Okay. Favorite brand of keg shoe? Kirkhart, SX8. Favorite anvil? Scott anvil. With the tapered heels or? I have the mini boy right now because let's be honest, I won't be able to, to lift anything <laughs> heavier out of, the, out of the truck. Tapered heel, that's my next one. Okay. Favorite inspirational quote? The man in the arena. That's a good one. Yep. Quite often is what people say. Do you have a farrier terrier? Nope. I find them annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I do love dogs. Yeah. Yeah. I have some, but... <laughs> you don't bring them with you? No, never. If you're stumped on a case or need backup, who do you call? I think you kind of said that. Kevin Alcock. Do you have a favorite shoe or package for a mystery lameness? Pull the shoe, throw it out the field. Is that a valid answer? Yep, it is. What do you use as your planner? Paper agenda. Favorite method of soothing aches and pains? Hot bathtub. Me too. And I don't have hot water right now. Huh? Oh, no? Nope. And it's getting cold in Spain. Like you don't have it, access to it at all or it just something Well, broke? we are not that bad and we also have electricity in the fridge, but <laughs> <laughs> the hot water heater is uh, it's kind of uh, done. Gone and I Kaputsky? Can't... Kaputsky, yeah. And uh, I can't get a technician out oh really they're very busy apparently a lot of hot water heaters are broken in the area oh wonderful mm -hmm. oh boy favorite drink it used to be beer used to be Beck's beer but you know what best thing about spain tinto de verano and i'm not a wine person but you mix red wine half red wine and you mix uh, something that is similar to seven up or sprite uh, okay yep hmm Tastes like fruit juice, like the berry stuff that you bought me yesterday. Right, okay. Yeah. You should see your face light up right now just thinking about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite song? I have many. Coldplay Fix You would be one. My playlist on Spotify is quite versatile. All over the map? Yep. Do you work out? What? Okay. 
<laughs> wow. I, I work with horses. Offended by the question. <laughs> I stack hay. <laughs> what do you use as your knives? Neil Baggett. Okay. I actually just dug it out again, sharpen it up. Is that a loop knife? Nope. You use a left and a right? I use a right-handed one, and I have a loop knife for, for the frog, a basoli loop knife. Okay. What would you have been if not a farrier? A total failure at life. <laughs> <laughs> the black sheep in the family, probably a vet or an equine photographer. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, that's, that's what I do as pastime, too. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And the final question, if you're going to be stuck in a shop with somebody for a month, who would you want it to be? Kevin Alcock. He's an incredibly humble person, and people don't realize how much he knows. And the way how he transmits it, you just understand it. We can spend days in the truck and just talk about horses and life and showing. And we always say, okay, we got to bring a note block. And I have to write the stuff down. <laughs> like we come up with solutions together, which is absolutely fantastic. Cool. So actually, Jim Blurton and Kevin gave a shoeing clinic in Mexico in March. Right. I was the interpreter. Yeah. And took x-rays of horses. We had uh, dressage horses there with the trainer. And the trainer would give us feedback before and after shoeing. And it was eye-opening. Cool. I can only recommend it. It's the dream team. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we were able to make this actually Finally, happen. Finally, it just took us two years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Debbie.